Mare's milk and deer's milk, and every beast that bears milk, between St Johnston and Dundee, come ah to me, come ah to me. This is one of the charms that a witch might recite if she wanted to steal milk from cows, and in this episode of Fabulous Folklore, we're going to have a look at a lot more charms used in witchcraft besides this one. Buckle up! Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. This is going to be a slightly different introduction to the one that I would normally do. It will also be relatively short. If you are on my email list and there's a link to sign up below and basically you'll just get a link every time an article goes live and you'll get a free guide to protecting your house with folkloric methods, although I still recommend a burglar alarm, then you'll have seen me basically address what's been happening in the news this week and committing fabulous folklore to remaining a space against all kinds of fascism and racism and I know folklore does have a bit of a tendency to attract particularly the nutjob neo-nazis. If you've never come across them on Twitter be thankful and they they do hide in plain sight but sometimes they do also fly under the radar and we've been rooting them out for quite some time now. But it's not enough to just simply go up against the obvious ones. It's also important to recognise tendencies like this in people that you know, even if they're unintentional or especially if they're unintentional and question what people say, call things people out on things, call me out on things if you think I've made a mistake or I've approached something the wrong way or if I've said something racist or anything like that then please do feel free to call me out. The content of the podcast is not going to change. I am sticking to northern european folklore because i'm in northern europe and that is where i come from and i'll be doing loads of ghost stories because let's be honest they're ghost stories and fairy lore and all that kind of thing because that they are the stories that i've grown up with and they are the stories from where i'm from and also i'll be including the mythology because i think they've got such wide ranging influences particularly roman as it was brought here then That is why I'm going to continue to do that. What I will be doing though, and I will be doing this in my email list, is I'll also be directing you to sources where people are talking about myths and legends and folklore from their own areas, um, because I figure we might as well hear it from the original people. And that could be other parts of Europe that are outside my experience. It could be other parts of the world like Asia, Africa, South America, even North America, Australia and New Zealand as well, because I just think it would be better for you to hear the stories from the people who know them better. So I'll be using the email list as a way to share and amplify those stories so that you can go and discover them from the original sources. And hopefully we'll all be able to enjoy a lot more folklore from all around the world. Because this is the thing, folklore is a thing that does actually bind us because everybody does tell stories and does preserve knowledge in this kind of way. So that is something that I think we will be looking at going forward. So I hope that is cleared everything up. If you do decide that you don't want to come back, then fair enough, can't stop you. If you go, yep, that's absolutely fine, I totally agree with you, then great. I was quite pleased that when I sent out the email, certainly my stands, nobody has unsubscribed. So that makes me feel a lot better about the kind of people who listen to Fabulous Folklore. So hopefully that is you as well and you're in this for the long haul because this is not going to be easy. Anyway, right, we're going to move on to this week's episode now that I've basically made my stance clear, made it apparent, that's that's where I'm coming from, hopefully that's where you're coming from. So we're going to move on to this week's episode by looking at charms in witchcraft. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. <laughs> Charms and rhymes characterise our memories of witchcraft and we normally get these from fairy tales, classic literature or fantasy films. You just have to think of things like Mirror Mirror on the Wall or Hubble Bubble Toil and Trouble. Either of those should ring a bell for you. And obviously these are really famous examples but they were invented for the purposes of fiction. Apologies for any bubbles burst. But charms do actually occupy a real place in the historical record and they were used as proof of witchcraft during the trials. 
Now, according to a short article in the Newcastle Daily Chronicle, a woman believed an imp plagued the tenement where her husband lay in his sickbed, and she actually bought a charm that would chase the imp away. But, and I quote, The charm did not work as was predicted. It was not in nature to suppose that a sixpenny charm could suffice in such a serious case. A change in the form of incantation was characterised by a considerable rise in the price of charms, end quote. And I think, as with anything else, you get what you pay for. Now, charms are often short rhyming verses recited to accompany an action or in the making of a talisman. And you might think that they sound similar to spells, and in some ways they are. But in general, the easiest way to approach it is a spell often refers to the overall piece of magic, but the charm is like a smaller part of it but we're going to be looking at shorter, less complex charms in this episode, particularly those from the historical record, because I think they're a little bit more interesting. Now, we opened the episode with a charm to steal milk, which I know it does sound like a pretty odd thing to do, but this is one of the things that in Scotland in particular, people accuse witches of doing, that they were stealing milk from their cattle. How they could tell, we will actually get into. But Robert Chambers, who was quoted in an 1890 edition of the Newcastle Courant, actually explained that the witch would make a rope from hair that she plucked from the cow's tails. She would then tie a knot in this rope for each cow that she wanted to steal milk from. She would hold the rope above a bucket and she would then use that to mine the act of milking into the bucket below. And while doing so, she would recite the rhyme. Mare's milk and deer's milk and every beast that bears milk between St Johnston and Dundee, come out to me, come out to me. And this would apparently cause the milk to appear in the bucket of its own accord. Now, some cows apparently knew when this was going on and they would alert their owners by lowing. And according to Chambers, I quote, an acute old woman could easily distinguish this low from any other as it bore a peculiar expression of pain, end quote. You could stop witches from doing this by laying rowan twigs that were bound together with red thread across the door of the barn. This would stop the witch's power. And in Aberdeenshire, farmers would actually tie a red thread around the tails of their cows. Rowan twigs, by the way, are from the rowan trees you've probably gathered by the name. And rowan was often used as a defence against witchcraft. And that's why sometimes rowan would be used for mantelpieces above fireplaces so it would stop witches coming down the chimney and so on. But we will probably have an episode on rowan trees in the very near future. Now, one of the other things that witches could apparently do, if you believe the confessions, is shapeshift into animals. And this kind of ability transform was a really common theme among the beliefs against witches. And hares in particular could be hunted if people believed that they were witches in disguise and charms became the way to affect the transformation. And famed witch Isabel Gowdy provided a whole range of charms during her confession, and I do say that in inverted commas, in 1662. And according to legend, she'd met the devil twice, once on the road and once in Allen's Kirk, and to baptise her in his satanic ways, the devil sucked some of her blood out of a scratch on her shoulder. And then he spat this into his hand and baptised her with it. But then when she wanted to do witchcraft, this is why she allegedly could do it. So when she or other witches wanted to turn into a hare, they had a particular charm. And I am going to read this out in sort of modern English rather than the original that is in the blog post that this episode comes from. But the charm read, I shall go into a hare with sorrow and such and mickle care. I shall go in the devil's name until I come home again. And then if they want to turn back into human form, and at some point I'm assuming that they would, they recited... Hair, hair, God send thee care. I am a hair's likeness just now. I shall be a woman's likeness even now. And that would apparently turn them from a hair back into a human again. They could also turn into cats using the charm. I shall go into a cat with such sorrow and such and a black shat. And I shall go in the devil's name until I come home again. And they could also use it to turn into crows. And again, the charm is very, very similar. I shall go into a crow with sorrow and such and a black throw. And I shall go in the devil's name until I come home again. These are all taken from the Witches Riches article from 1890. And if you do try any of these, you do do so at your own risk. That is a disclaimer. Although if they do work, I will be fascinated to know. Now, if you listen to the weather law episode from a few weeks ago, we did have a look at charms that could raise storms. But I thought it was worth mentioning them again here, just in case you didn't hear that. But one of the things around storm raising was sailors really feared this ability of witches to raise tempests. And even King James I became convinced that witches caused the storms that basically left his wife-to-be from leaving Denmark on her way to Scotland to become his bride. And this partly explained his vehemence against witches, which led to the publication of Demonology. 
Now, it wasn't just kings that feared these powers, and parents actually instructed children to break any eggshells to stop witches using them to sail out to sea. And to be honest, like raising sounds actually sounds like a bit of an easy spell, and all they needed was a wet rag and a piece of wood. And they would use the rag and they would beat that on the timber and they would chant this following charm three times. I knock this rag upon this stain to raise the will in the devil's name. It shall not lie under I please again. And then when they wanted it, you end the storm, they would dry out the rag and they would basically do the motion again and they would repeat another charm three times. We lay the wind in the devil's name. It shall not rise until we like to rise it again. Now, none of the sources explain why witches wanted to raise storms in the first place. Was it a demonstration of power against a society that shunned them? Was it just simply to cause havoc? Or were they trying to prevent someone from reaching land? And in the tale of the Laidly Worm of Spindlestone Who, which is a Northumberland folk tale, where essentially the short version is a king goes off and to find a new wife because his wife's died, comes back with this typical evil stepmother, which is just a dreadful trope that we need to get rid of, and she places an enchantment on the king's beautiful daughter and turns her into a dragon, who is the Laidly Worm. And her brother comes back from time of seas, he's called Child Wind, and the Wicked Queen raises this tempest to stop him from landing so he can rescue his sister from this evil spell. Now, there are also charms to preserve life, and Joe Bath relates a charm intended to act as a form of literal life insurance. And in the 1690s, a Newcastle-based cunning man called Peter Banks sold year-long leases for 20 shillings. And these leases prevented the holder from dying in that time. You do have to wonder how long you could actually keep that up. And sailors loved the leases, which took the form of paper charms. And the wording read, and I quote, I charge you and all of you in the high sword name to assist and bless the person's name, belonging to such and such a ship, from all rocks and sands, storms and tempests, thereunto belonging for this year. End quote. And those sailors who survived returned to buy a new one every year. The account doesn't explain how they felt when they learned that other sailors died, which would imply that their lease had failed, and considering how many shipwrecks there usually are around the British coast and elsewhere, it does rather make you wonder quite how many of these leases worked. Now, the wife of a shipwright did actually discover that her husband had bought one of them and she obviously wasn't very happy about this and she burned it and Banks warned her that she'd never be worth a groat or fourpence because of her actions and it does seem that her family fortune declined so perhaps Banks knew what he was doing after all. We'll never know. But finally, we're going to have a look at another category of charms which are quite popular and this is to actually defy witchcraft and As you've probably gathered from listening to these episodes and just in general, the belief in and fear of witches was a very real thing in earlier centuries and protecting yourself from witchcraft involved a whole range of superstitions and, you guessed it, charms. Making witch bottles, which we looked at like way back at the beginning, was one such way of directing the power of a witch back towards him or her. Now, there was an anti-witchcraft rhyme from 1800 from Teesdale, which apparently kept witches at bay, And that read, Witchy, witchy, I defy thee, four fingers round my thumb, let me go quietly by thee. Now, I'm sure that the irony of using charms which were associated with witches to repel witches wasn't lost on them. Though if the reciting of charms made you a witch, well, I'll leave you to work out the rest of that one. Now, it is possible that some witches believed in the power of their charms and choosing rhymes made them easier to remember and possibly pass on to others. Because if you think about all the rhymes that you learn and so on, it does make things easier to remember if there's kind of a rhythm and and whatnot. That's why you can remember song lyrics so easily because they're easier to stick in your mind because of that rhyming structure. And for others, they may have just chosen to recite simple rhymes to make a boring task more exciting. And who hasn't wanted to pass the time more quickly when doing something that you really, really hate? So it's entirely possible that some people thought that charms really worked Other people, it was just kind of a a way to pass the time. And either way, charms then passed into legend. The original uses often become stripped away from the charms once they pass into history. And it's quite funny because how many people might inadvertently use one themselves? Like if you're sitting in traffic and you're praying for the traffic light to change or if you're driving around a car park, like let there be a space, let there be a space. Who's to say that you're not using a modern version of charms yourself? And in all honesty... What is the difference between a a witch chanting a charm over a cup of tea to boost her mood 
and a new age spiritual person chanting affirmations to improve their self-esteem. They are, to my mind, one and the same. Now, what I would like to know, if you're listening, is what kind of charms would you use? Which ones of these categories? So, probably not stealing milk, I'm going to hazard a guess. But, you know, would would you want to shapeshift into an animal? Would you be raising storms? Or would you be trying to protect your home? Or protect life as well, which is incredibly important. So, which ones would you want to use and why? You can grab me on any of the social media platforms and we can discuss any of the things that have come up in this episode, if you like. I'm quite open to that. And yeah, next week we're going to have a look at necromancy. So it's a bit of a change in pace because why not? And we're hopefully going to dispel some of the misconceptions about what necromancy is and is not in next week's episode. So look forward to that one. In the meantime, stay safe, be kind to others, do good in the world and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com. And that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio.